Hi, everybody. Um, your first reaction may be, gee, Instructor Gallagher, you've gone rather casual on us. Um, for today only. Um, I'll be back to collared shirt, shirt next lecture. But I busted out this concert t-shirt. This happens to be the 10,000 Maniacs Blind Man Zoo Tour um, featuring uh, Natalie Merchant, a wonderful singer. But um, because I'm going to use concert tours and tickets and merchandise as an example about free markets and the supply curve and the demand curve. So just to illustrate a point, not to say that it isn't really comfortable, it is really comfortable. <laughs> but I must maintain proper decorum, which means collared shirt next lecture and going forward in all likelihood unless I can justify it very well. Um, okay, so basically free market economy is, as the name implies, there's really no government intervention in setting a price, okay? The sellers don't set the price and really the buyers don't set the price. There really comes to a equilibrium point where both the buyers and the, the sellers are happy with, um, with the way the prices are set, or at least in the range, okay? Uh, for example, when it comes to tickets, um, if the tickets are too expensive, A, you may not go, B, you may wait for that concert to come out on a DVD and buy the DVD uh, instead of spending $150 for those good seats. Um, or, for example, you may decide, well, we can sit in the upper deck instead of sitting you know, in row 20, in which case we'd save about 150 bucks. So, I mean, supply and demand is based on, and tickets are the easiest things to justify. Just go to Ticketmaster or uh, AXS tickets or flash tickets. Um, and clearly, the better the seats, um, the pricier they are. Supply and demand. Um, and, um, so that's sort of the basis of, uh, of a free market is, um, and there's many other examples, cars. I mean, as, as uh, the economy slows down, car sales, new, new car sales are going to slow down, okay? So you're going to be able to, if you're looking to buy a new car and you saved up for it, you're probably going to get a much better deal very soon than either now or the deal you would have gotten a year ago, okay? Uh, clearly, rents in Denver actually, uh, housing prices in Denver have risen because people in cities such as San Francisco and Los Angeles and other places find Denver to be inexpensive. Um, rental prices have dropped uh, about 10%. So, um, again, supply and demand, and uh, there's no um, mandate or law that stipulates what a price has to be. Airline tickets are another great example of that, okay? If you fly um, on an unpopular route at an unpopular hour, it's amazing how much of a difference you'll find in pricing of the same ticket, okay? Still getting from A to B, but you're going to get there a lot cheaper because, you know, airline tickets and hotel rooms are the ultimate, think about this for a second, they're the ultimate perishable goods. I mean, you, you go into King Super or Ralph's and you look in the produce section or you go to some place, it says sell by date, okay? And you look and you say, okay, well, this is a perishable good because it's only supposed to be consumed within the next week. But the ult I would argue the ultimate perishable goods are airline seats and hotel rooms because when the plane takes off, their airline seat that they were charging $500 for a week ago is worth zero once the plane leaves the gate. Likewise, that hotel room that may have been costing $125 costs nothing as soon as the clock ticks over to the next day. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, you have to be careful how you price things because if you price yourself out of the market, your return could drop to zero very, very quickly. Okay. So, and that's the free market at work. There's nobody stipulating that the price has to be a certain amount. 
as it should be. Um, now the supply curve, um, now we get to use my friend, the semi-functional whiteboard, okay? So supply curve is, is basically saying that, okay, at a very low price, I have very little incentive to produce any of it, okay? So say, if I can only get $5 if it's a tour t-shirt and I'm producing t-shirts for the Imagine Dragons Nickelback tour, okay, well, there may not be a great demand, but by the same token, if you're doing the merch, you're going to say, well, I'm not going to make too many of these because, you know, it's not like they're banging down the doors to see these shows. So, down here. But as summer goes on and other tours come along, say it's the Beyonce Cardi B show, uh, doubleheader, um, you might be able to get 25 maybe even $30 for those shirts. Um, before you say to yourself, gee, Instructor Gallagher's pretty street. He knows. <laughs> How does he know these bands? Um, well, Beyonce, I, I know from Destiny's Child. That's the Bill Gallagher era of, of Beyonce. And then Cardi B grew up in my dad's neighborhood, the Fort Washington area of the Bronx. So that's where the familiarity with, with Cardi B comes from. Um, so the prices, so that's, that's the supply curve. As people are willing to pay more for it, you're willing to make more of it, okay? Which is, it really kind of makes a lot of sense. Now, the demand curve works differently. If the price is $30, and again, it's we're talking Imagine Dragons Nickelback, uh, if the t-shirts are 30 bucks, the demand is going to be next to nothing, okay? So, but again, if it's a popular tour, people are going to demand, if the prices are lowered, people are really going to be demanding it. And regardless of the tour, if the price gets cheap enough, people say, well, I can always use these t-shirts to help wash my car or something. You know, I mean, they'll find other uses for the shirts. So you get to a point where people will just, you know, they'll, they'll buy it because it's, it's cheaper than buying towels, basically. But again, that's below a point where you're willing to make it. So what's the equilibrium price? you might be able to guess it's where these two lines intersect and that is the free market equilibrium point that is the free market equilibrium price that's where the demand curve intersects with the supply curve okay so um, the best explanation of demand curve and supply curve is found once again and I've referred to this before, um, on the sidebars of your book. These, def these definitions along here do a better job of defining it very, very crisply and cleanly. So when you're preparing for your quizzes, don't forget to go back and review these sidebars, okay? Because they'll distill down the answers to the question. Some will just flat out answer the question for you, okay? So if you want a quick tip on learning these things. Um, the next thing we go into in this chapter, really, like I said, there's only a couple more things to cover. Um, we've just covered three of them. We've just covered free market, which is again, there's nobody demanding a price. Uh, it's the, the buyers and the sellers agree. And then the supply curve and the demand curve determines the equilibrium point, which is the optimal point to produce and to pay. Okay? And, on, and when we get on, on into our discussions, please circle back with me if, if you'd like me to, to, to go into that in more detail. Um, the other thing is, is the different types of competition. Now, perfect competition is like milk at a grocery store, where there's not enough differentiation between the product where you could charge a premium price. Okay, milk by and large is milk. Rice is by and large rice. Then, you know, you could, if 
you're an argumentative sort, you can say, well, this milk really is a little better than the other. But as far as what people are willing to pay, typically it falls in a very flat level, okay? So there's very little variance in what grocery stores can charge. So that's basically perfect competition. The book says, the degree of competitions in which there are many sellers in the market and none is large enough to dictate the price of a product. Truth. I mean, the price for milk is the price for milk. Now, there's monopolistic competition, and that's when, it, I'll use again their definition, the degree of competition in which a very large numbers of sellers produce very similar products that buyers nevertheless perceive as different. Different. Now, that may, let me read it one more time because I do want to make an important point about this. And this ties into a later chapter, by the way. Um, monop monopolistic competition is the degree of competition in which a very large number of sellers produce very similar products that buyers nevertheless perceive as different. And how can you tell if it's monopolistic competition? It's products that get very heavily advertised, right? Um, to me, I mean, I mean, I'm sure the, the the devil's malt hasn't crossed many of your lips yet, but I've had a few beers along the way, <laughs> gotten to the stage of life I'm in, and quite frankly, some of them I can't tell the difference one from the other. Okay, so they. And I'm not alone in that either. I mean, I don't know too many people that are so devoted to a brand that, you know, if they're going to a barbecue, it's like whatever's cold, toss me a can of it. Um, soda is the same way. Pepsi versus Coke. Uh, A&W root beer versus Hires root beer versus, you know, I mean, so there's some subtle differences, but not enough to dominate a market, Okay. So you have to advertise heavily to, to make a perception of differentiation. And we're, in the marketing section of the chapter, we're going to get into that in a lot more detail, how effective advertising um, can make such a huge difference. I'm going to show you an ad. I'm, for example, I'm going to show you an ad where during the ad campaign, it, 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 was, it was sales for a particular beer, for Carlsberg beer. And during the ad campaign, sales of Carlsberg beer went up 500%. Now, if, if you think the beer tasted any different during the ad campaign, it didn't, okay? It was just a very effective ad. It just sort of tugged at the heartstrings of, of people. And during the Super Bowl in football, um, and the World Cup. Soccer ads do a great job at this, too. Um, making an affinity with the fans, with the product. And that, you know, that's how when you've got monopolistic competition where there's the products have very little differentiation between them, but the consumers perceive there's differentiation. That's because companies have had very effective marketing campaigns. Uh, oligopoly is the next category. And that's when there's um, basically uh, just a few sellers dominate the market. The best example of that is aircraft. Okay, Bo Boeing is a big aircraft manufacturer, commercial aircraft. Airbus, which is a consortium of European manufacturers, is the other major um, type of, of aircraft manufacturer. So um, the automobile industry, to some extent, there's more, but there's not a lot, right? There's just sort of a handful, and that handful, quite frankly, is probably going to get smaller and smaller. So um, it's a case where there's fewer and fewer sellers. Now, the dilemma with that is the propensity for prices rising, right? If you, which leads me to the next and final subject in this matter, which is monopolies. Now, monopolies have no competition which means that, in theory, they could charge whatever they like for their product. I mean, when, I, when, I, when I'm broadcasting this or taping this lecture uh, and watching TV uh, and I'm using my Wi-Fi, I only have one choice. If I don't like it, 
I do without Wi-Fi, period. So government has to step in in some of these cases to regulate that, to make sure that the, the public's just simply not being ripped off. Uh, drugs are another example, you know, certain medicines, um, patents I believe, medical patents run for a long time. Now the reason for that is that a lot of these companies put many years of research and development into a product. Um, almost goes back to this thing about the t-shirts, whereas a drug company would say, okay, well if we're only going to sell this much of it, let's not spend too much time and money making that product, okay? because we're not gonna get any return on investment for it. But others um, take many years of research and development to become effective and tested and safe. And then, but eventually the patent runs out and then you can get generic versions of the drug. So that's um, one of the cases with monopolies. A, governments can oversee it to make sure the public's not being grossly overcharged. And then secondly, uh, patent protection only lasts so long for many industries. Okay, so um, there's that. Um, I think those are really the key points for the second half of. I'm just gonna flip a couple pay. Oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say we're done with this, but um, yeah, actually we're done with this part. We've we've crossed 15 minutes. Um, I should probably do 15 minutes the next section I'm gonna put this back on the shelf and wear something with a little more decorum for the second part which is talking about socialism communism and capitalism see you soon <laughs>